The Angel of the Sunshine Church by Erna Olson Zan was published in July 1961 in the Christian Herald magazine. When one stirs the ashes of the Civil War, there are still two glowing coals that crackle. Both of these hot spots are in the uh, are in Georgia. For Southerners, it is the route from Atlanta to the sea where Sherman's troops left uh, fields blackened and homes in flames. For the North, it is the memory of the Confederate per prison at Andersonville, about 95 miles south of Atlanta, where more than 30,000 Northern soldiers languished in such pitiless squalor that many of their own accord walked over, to the, walked over the dead line to be shot. But the ashes also yield one of the most heartwarming stories of the war. On July 31, 1864, between Atlanta and Andersonville, a little-known battle took place at Sunshine Church near Round, Ro Round Oak, Jones County. Heroine of this conflict was a young Southern woman who, when her chance for vengeance came, displayed, instead of such misery um, and compa compassion, that she was never forgotten by Sherman's Ohio Brigade and by their descendants. The story of Betty Hunt is told in a stack of brittle and yellowed letters now in the possession of her granddaughter, Dossie Hunt, to you of Birmingham, Alabama, and her mother, Mrs. Thomas Carver Hunt, Betty's daughter-in-law, both of whom had heard the tale over and over, as well as its romantic sequel 25 years later, which concerns some Georgians to this, to this day. When the struggle for Atlanta was raging that summer of 1864, 26-year-old Betty Hunt was living with her babies, Emily and Robert, on the old Hunt plantation which had been the fam in the family for four generations at that time. Daughter of a, of a Macon, Georgia uh, physician, Dr. Robert Carver of Massachusetts ancestry, she had come here as a bride, well taught as southern girls were in running a large household. For three years, Betty had been managing the plantation alone, for uh, young Captain Jesse Hunt and his eight brothers were off to war. While the men were gone, emancipation had loosed the slaves. Burloughed home uh, to see how things were going, Jesse found his Negroes still in their little homes back of the big house, not studying to leave, uh, leave young Miss in the face of an invading army. They clung to her like children did, like babies. Negroes and Jesse's eldest sister, Anne Haskell, with failing sight, who lived alone three miles away, all depended on Betty Hunt. Sunshine Church, the spiritual home of the neighborhood, lay peacefully between the Haskell and Hunt plantations. On that faithful July day, it was caught between two combating armies. The assault on Atlanta, arsenal of the Confederacy, had not been as easy as General Thur uh, Sherman had hoped. Supplies were still pouring in from the south. Macon, the Confederate treasury, 90 miles to the southeast, held captive 1,100 northern officers. Andersonville Prison was about 50 miles beyond Sherman, uh, beyond, and Sherman could use the help of these prisoners in crushing southern resistance. Sherman well knew that General Lee had not con, uh, concentrated all his military might on the Richmond lines. There were at least three generals of exceptional valor and ability left to hold Georgia. At Lovejoy, 15 miles south of Atlanta, waited General Fighting Joe Wheeler. Uh, with him was General Alfred Iverson, a native Georgian. Iverson knew the roads and rivers like the lines on his palm. There was a third Confederate general in Sherman's path, but Joseph Johnson was temporarily out of commission, resting from battle wounds in Macon. He would have no army there but the young and the maimed. Sherman had four or five cavalry generals for the, uh, for the South Georgia conquest, while he himself assailed Atlanta. These four generals, Stoneman, Gerard, Kilpatrick, and McCook, were to, often, uh, were to soften up Georgia for his march to the sea. West Pointer George Stoneman, who commanded a cavalry of 3,000 men at Decatur, east of Atlanta, was sent on a threefold mission. First, he must proceed to Lovejoy with the, the three other northern generals and destroy Wheeler. Next, they must cut the railroads and supply lines at Atlanta. This accomplished, Stoneman must take Macon and finally Andersonville, and for this task, he had in his wagon, uh, wagon trains arms for 30,000 men. Of all these objectives, one inflamed Stoneman's heart. 
if he could be um, emblazoned across history as the liberator of Andersonville, he would be content. Every northern mother, wife, and sister was praying for this liberation, and so great a feat would gain a man the gratitude of an entire nation. Andersonville Prison had been in operation only since uh, the November before. Though there were rumors, Betty Hunt and other Georgians knew little of what was going on except that the enemy was there. Um, struggling alone for the fourth year, the women were hard put to raise enough food for themselves, not dreaming of the inhuman conditions at Andersonville or that the prison keeper was a maniac. But Stoneman knew, and now he had the arms, supplies, um, the swiftly moving troops, the time to strike. Leaving Wheeler at the railroad's destruction to the other northern generals, he um, veered to the southeast in an arc, pillaging and burning his way through Covington, Monticello, Hillsborough, Round Oak, and Clinton. Uh, though he passed the Hunt Plantation, for some reason he did not touch it. Since he encountered no resistance, Macon was soon reached. As Stoneman fired his first triumphal shots into Macon, a fierce cannonade hit, uh, hit him full force. General Johnston had roused from his sickbed, rallied the young and maimed to man the freight car guns. So vigorous uh, was the repulse that the Northerners fell back to remote uh, or to reroute around the city. This there was this was no time for Stoneman to dissipate his strength on anything or any one but the suffering thousands at Andersonsville. It would be worth his all. By now, Wheeler had instructed General Iverson to attack the invader where he found him. With only 1,300 Confederates at his command, Iverson dogged and harassed the Northerners on a 15-mile retreat from Macon to Clinton, then swung around to, encom to encompass the wooded hill at Sunshine Church, 10 miles beyond. Here he knew every knob and knoll. When Stoneman reached this place the morning of July 31, 1864, he rode into a V-shaped trap. Infilidated by shot and shell, terrified by rebel yells, from hill to hill, Stoneman believed himself surrounded by a great Confederate force. In the sturdy little log church, um, a shock after shock of rifle fire, its windows were shattered, the trees broken and torn, and as far as Ann Haskell's door, the fields were strewn with dead and dying horses and battered guns. Stoneman's flank, or left flank, gave way. Ordering them to break out if they could, he remained with 600 men in, holding, in a holding fight. All through the morning, the battle raged. Stoneman's horse was shot from under him. The Confederates cut his army in two. There seemed nothing left in the face of overwhelming odds but to run up the white flag. To this, uh, to his great humiliation, General Stoneman found he had surrendered his magnificent cavalry and rich supply trains to a band of ragged men. As he saw his dearest uh, ambition fade, when he thought of the men still starving at Andersonville, General Stoneman wept. But Iverson had not a moment to, to lose. Sherman might be on his way to help. The surrender complete, he lit out after the fleeing Yankees and brought them back. Northern dead and wounded him, he left in charge of the community folk at Sunshine Church and the Haskell House. Able prisoners, including Stoneman, were marched to Macon. It was one of the most brilliant of Confederate victories. The hill on which the Federal General left his dreams is still called Stoneman's Hill. When the tumult and the uh, shouting ceased, neighborhood children crept in to look. The scene, as they reported, surpassed all previous tales of carnage. Word was sent to Betty Hunt that her sister-in-law's house was full of wounded men. Hastening to her, she found Anne um, moved to one of the downstairs rooms, going in and out of, the, out of a window to avoid stepping on human bodies. Among the severely injured was B.F. Morris of Pavona, Ohio, felled by the first shot of the battle, now lying with a shattered arm in a pool of his own blood. Morris would have been killed by another shot had it not been for the wallet over his heart containing a picture of his sweetheart. Would he ever see her again? <clears throat> Lying there thinking, weeping, he craved, he carved his initials into a wall plank. The next morning, along with other badly injured, Morris was taken to the church, now, became, now become a hospital. To the more able, Ann Haskell turned over her home and nursed them as well as she could. Thomas Perry of Lucas, Ohio, 
and W.F. Gladden of Mansfield, Ohio, were to remember her all their lives. To pass her church on the way home was almost more than Betty Hunt could endure. Out of the splintered windows came moaning and calling for help. Stealing herself to enter, Betty's heart was sickened at the sight. A soldier laying in a blood-soaked blue uh, reached out and begged for water. These were Betty's enemies, and now she saw them at last face to face. They had burned uh, the homes of her friends, had riddled her sister-in-law's house with bullets, would kill her husband without a second thought. Now, by strange fate, uh, they had been left helpless in this, her place of worship, in the church to which she had come as a bride, the splintered, jagged church that would never be the same as far as the pulpit and choir rose, blue on blue they lay, calling for mercy from her hand. They were in God's house, they were his children, and she was his servant. <clears throat> Turning to the Negro driver, who stayed or who stood white eyed behind her, she said, Go home, tell Emma to get some bed sheets and my medicine chest, bring rags, cups, and lots of water, tell Joe to get buttermilk out of the spring house and come to help me. For two months, the women of the congregation ministered to the northern wounded at Sunshine Church, but none said B.F. Morris later was as faithful as Betty Hunt. Daughter of a physician, she knew something about dressing wounds, and her finest linens were torn into bandages. The resources of her big plantation were put at their disposal, feeding them dainties, praying for them, writing letters to loved ones back home. She restored them to their health. They called her an angel. Even when Jesse came home on furlough, he had nothing but praise for her conduct and talked and walked with his enemies in utter and utmost kindness. In early September, word filtered into the community that Sherman had taken Atlanta. He would soon start his march to the sea, sparing nothing and no one in his way. Huddling together one day, the prisoners at Sunshine Church composed the following letter to General Sherman. We, the underside members of General Stoneman's Cavalry Command, Army of the Ohio, USA, cannot permit the opportunity to pass now that we are here, are about to leave this place, and perhaps in all probability may not meet in this life again, of expressing our feelings of gratitude to Mrs. Jessie Hunt for her many acts of kindness and sympathy during our stay in the hospital. This, Though she may have suffered from from us, she has forgotten everything in the natural feelings of a generous and noble disposition, considering only how she could relieve our wants and alleviate our sufferings, visiting us frequently, soothing our sorrow by friendly words, and sending delicacies for the sick and wounded. May our Father in heaven, who sees all things and knows the inmost secrets of every heart, reward her bountifully. Though we may never have a chance of repaying her kindness, the recollections of having uh, done a good action will be of some comfort to her. We go to return perhaps in a short time to our several homes, or it may be to linger in some forgotten prison camp, but whatever we are during uh, the remaining portion of our lives, and in the respective family circles when peace shall once more be restored to our dear land, the name of Mrs. Jesse Hunt will be remembered with feelings of fond, respectful recollections. We earnestly request any of our troops that may hereafter pass through the country to refrain from injuring her property in every respect. At the end of September, before the prisoners were taken to Macon, they pressed the letter into Betty's hand. When they were gone, she went back to her plantation, hardly knowing how wearied she was from her long vigil. With her babies, she wanted to go home to Macon for a change of scene and rest. There were two silver cake, cake baskets in Mary's dining room uh, cupboards that she dearly cherished. These had been wedding gifts. Her heirloom silver marked with uh, the carver C, silver canisters, and all the other accoutrements of her table. She had buried in a secret place before she left. Then, leaving the plantation to trusted Negroes, she took the children and the letter, and went to her old home about 25 miles away. It was a, fat a fatal mistake. While she was gone, Sherman passed the plantation. No one was there, to present, uh, was there to present the letter from his men. Ordering the furniture and bedding out of the house, he then burned. Uh, he then had burned. Few pieces 
if any, were left. All the Negroes' little homes, the barns, sheds, and the gin house with forty bales of cotton, the fields all were set ablaze, some stock was taken for meat, and the rest were destroyed. It was said that Sherman himself applied the torch to Sunshine Church, where his men had suffered such humiliating defeat, but for some unknown reason. Both the Hunt and Haskell houses were left standing unharmed amid their blackened acres. When Betty returned, all that she ever found was one muddy cake basket pierced through with a sword, the silver canisters, and six of, car of uh, the carver spoons. These were all she had to show Jesse when, after Apatomoc he returned to start life with her anew. There was a sequel to the story. A quarter century went by. It was 1889, and not a word had passed between Betty and the, the prisoners of Sunshine Church now safe in their homes. Not a single letter, card, message, or greeting. Though they spoke of her often, they did not even know where to address the angel who had saved their lives. The 25th reunion of Sherman's Brigade would be held in July at Mansfield, Ohio. B.F. Morris got to thinking that the men would like to know if Betty were still alive, how she had uh, fared since the war, what happened when she presented their letter to the general. Morris had long since married his sweetheart and was a prosperous citizen. Having taught himself to write with his left hand, he addressed a letter to Betty in care of the postmistress of Clinton, Georgia, who prominently forwarded it to the Hunt Plantation. What excitement this letter brought to the Hunt home, especially to Hattie, Thomas and Annie Dell, born since the war. It was, their, it was a thrilling new chapter in an oft-told tale. Their father, as was proper for the head of the house, sat down and answered for his wife. They were in good health, he said, and had done well. Working the plantation year-round, they raised horses, cattle, sheep, swine, grain, syrup, cotton, and nearly everything they used. Then he made an, astound an astounding proposition. Come down and visit us, he wrote, and I will try to make it pleasant for you. The Morrises lost no time in accepting and spent three weeks at the plantation. Sunshine Church had been rebuilt and, the, uh, had been rebuilt and Morris stood in the pulpit and retold the battle story. He and his wife were guests at the barbecue at the Frank Haskell home, though the host's health was broken and Anne nearly blind. Morris wrote um, later, Seated there at the table, on the exact spot where I had spent my first night as a prisoner, I looked at the initials in the wall plank, and then at my wife, and it was with great difficulty that I could control my emotions. At the end of the vacation, Morris ma made Mr. Hunt an equally astounding offer. Bring your wife to our brigade reunion, he said, and deliver our main address. Because she was recovering from illness, Betty did not accompany her husband to the reunion. It was a great affair with 1,000 men and women at the banquet tables. Jesse Hunt was seated at the head with the Honorable John Sherman, brother of the general. As he rose to speak, Jesse picked up a piece of silver and looked at it. Just wanted to see if it was mine, he said dryly. This brought down the house. For 30 minutes, Jesse orated on the progress of the South, and his uh, listeners watered their mouths when he uh, watered at the mouth when he told of his new hybrid peaches of, of which he was the first commercial grower in Jones County. Concluding his speech he bowled his audience over by inviting them to come to Jones County and settle with their families for land could be had convenient uh, to a railroad at ten dollars an acre. The war is over he said. Peace has blessed our land. You fought for what you thought was right. I did the same. You are the Old North, and I am the New South. B.F. Morris went straight home and wrote to Betty, I hasten to tell you that Mr. Hunt captured the whole brigade. We had to take him off the platform to shake hands with all of them. Only your presence was needed to make you the center of the crown of rejoicing. When Jesse returned home, bringing the news that several families were coming to settle, his daughter Hattie with sparkling blue eyes and full of life at twenty-three, imagined meeting some of the sons of the men her mother saved. Instead, one of the younger vet veterans himself came, a widower who wanted to start a new life. He was John Craig, a music dealer in, of Mansfield, Ohio, whose family was later to become famous in the Green Bay 
uh, in the Green Bay Tree, written by a relative, Louise Bromfield, Louis Bromfield. John Craig looked at Hattie Hunt and thought that, of all the Georgia peaches, she was the prettiest. W. F. Gladden came to make his home in Jones County and went to see the aging Anne Haskell, who had once been so kind to him. She thanked the Lord every day of her life, he wrote later, that he had lifted the curse of slavery from her land, and while she lived to see it, though it cost all she owned on earth. B. F. Morris bought land and had and had it farmed out since he was disabled. Other families came, and their descendants still live in Jones County. The wedding ring that John Craig that John Craig of Sherman's one of Sherman's men slipped on the figure finger of Hattie Hunt was a symbol of her mother's tender forgiveness, uh, forgiving love that had become a, had come full circle since the war. Hattie and John settled in Jones County and went to raising peaches. The Craigs were members of the old church and now lie in its graveyard with Betty and Jesse, friend and former foe side by side. There are no angry coals at the Sunshine Church.